In these uncertain economic times, it's easy to be worried about protecting your wealth, your hard-earned savings, and your family's financial future. Plunging interest rates, the devaluating dollar, and political unrest constantly threaten what you have worked hard to earn and all that you own. That's why now it's more important than ever to protect your assets and have the money you need to make your dreams come true. Welcome to the Global Wealth Fortress Report with successful global entrepreneur and wealth preservation expert, Joel Nagel. Joel's helped thousands of people just like you protect what you have so that you can make even more and make your every dream come true. So, sit back and enjoy Joel Nagel's offshore expert advice on how you can live the good life at a great price, where the sun never sets on your financial fortress. Hello and welcome to Joel Nagel's Wealth Fortress Report. And I am happy to have with us during this Christmas season, Joel Nagel himself, America's number one asset protection attorney. Joel, welcome and Merry Christmas. Thank you, Carter. It's really great to be with you. And yeah, Merry Christmas. Happy holidays to everybody who's uh, tuning in. It's Joel, speaking of the people who are tuning in, I've gotten a lot of uh, e emails, even some text messages over the past couple of weeks. And they want to know, and I think this time of year, Christmas, when everybody gets a little more laid back is a good time to address it. They want to know, you know, we know, Carter, because you've told us over and over, Joel Nagel is America's number one asset protection attorney, which has the, as Henry Kissinger once said, it has the added advantage of being true. Um, and they said, with that a given, who is Joel Nagel? What's his background? Help us know him personally a little bit. So this time of year is perfect for that. Joel, let, let's let's go back. I feel like Ralph Edwards now. So a lot of our younger people are saying, what the heck is a Ralph Edwards? You probably don't remember. <laughs> There's a great show called This Is Your Life. And Ralph Edwards would yes. talk to people and say, this is your life. So this is your life, Joel Nagel. Joel, where did you come from? What's your background? How does a guy get to be so concerned about helping others protect their assets? Well, well, thanks, Carter. I appreciate that. And, and let me just say that it's nice to take a little break and, and hang out and talk casually with you because you said, hey, everybody's a little, bore, little bit more laid back during the, the holidays. But uh, the world that I live in, unfortunately, is not that way. It's, uh, it's oh. running a thousand miles an hour. You know, a lot of people are, are worried. Um, you know, they feel like maybe they've had a tiny reprieve with what's happened in Washington. Uh, people were expecting much higher taxes, uh, much harsher uh, rules concerning transfers to estates and trusts and things like that. And those things probably are still coming, but they haven't happened yeah. yet. And uh, at this right. point, people are sensing that, that 2021 is coming to a close. And so they're they're rushing fast and furious to make things happen. You know, I just uh, spent yesterday and today with clients here in Belize where I am. And, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're stressed. Um, so it's nice to hang out with you and, and talk casually. And, and thanks for asking me about myself. Uh, I don't usually talk about myself, honestly. No. It's, it's usually, usually I'm talking about the clients and, and about wh who they are and what they're trying to accomplish. But, uh, you know, I, 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 if I tell you about my past, that probably does explain why I do what I do, quite honestly. I mean, I, I didn't come from means and by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, I grew up in rural Western Pennsylvania. Um, I, uh, uh, my father died when I was very, very young. I was raised by, a, you know, I was one of four children, single mom. And, and you know, I, even as a young child, I, I saw and could see and sense some of the ways that people honestly took advantage of her financially, uh, she didn't have great uh, wherewithal, particularly when it came to money. Um, but fortunately, my father had put some things in place. He had a, a, a trust where we owned a life insurance policy on him. So when he died, you know, the trust had resources. Uh, the trust paid off the home we lived in. So even though we, we never really had money, I always had a home to live in. And, and um, you know, I look at those things, I, I think they really shaped me early on who i am and uh you know i've always been for you know people say oh you just work with you know wealthy people 
And obviously, you know, you do more things, more structures, more legal work for people to have more money. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm really a champion of trying to help all people save what they have. You know, I mean, I've, right. I've gone to uh, school receptions where one of my children's school teachers pulled me aside and said, hey, you know, I have $50,000 and I, I want to know how to protect it and preserve it. And, you know, if you don't have money, sometimes, you know, protecting and preserving, it's even more important than people to do. You know, if you if you have one hundred million dollars and you lose a million dollars, you know, you're not going to be going to the, the soup kitchens or, you know, sleeping out on the street. But, you know, I, I, I deal with a lot of people. A lot of people these days are very stressed and worried and and particularly with, you know, this, you know, this rush of inflation that we're seeing. You know, I mean, we could we could talk all day about what caused it and why. And, you know, I think it's clear it's not transitory. Right. It's it's really here yeah. to stay. So you have people that, you know, maybe whether they're on Social Security, they have a pension, maybe they have a fixed pool of assets. They're really worried. I mean, I can sense it. I, I hear it in their voices all the time. And uh, so working and helping people like that is it, it, it really what motivates me and makes me get up in the morning. You know, people say. You know, why, why do you need to take my case? You know, you're successful. You, you're doing very well for yourself and your family. Uh, but it's really just helping helping people. I mean, you know, if I get somebody who's a, a jerk, you know, I'm not, I don't care how much they want to pay me. I'm not going to I'm not going to help them. But other yeah. people, yeah. you know, who, who have more modest means, we still give them our absolute best to help them try to, you know, protect and preserve and pass on their wealth because it's important to them. It's important. to them. So, you know, Burns. Remember the the poet uh, Robert Burns wrote the 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 child is the father of the man. The, the child is the father. Yeah. So clearly, in your case, that's evidence in what you do for a living. Now you saw your mother struggling. I mean, a single mother raising four children, even if she didn't have house payments, still had a heck of a lot of bills that were yeah. tough to pay. You may have Absolutely. seen, you know, I, I was a my dad was a minister, and and I got to tell you, you know. Um, I saw a lot of people with a lot of money who would take very unfair advantage of those who were needy in dad's churches. And I'm sure as a child, you know, you saw the same thing where you wondered, you know, couldn't, you know, the, these people with the money, you know, mom's trying to struggle by. She doesn't need to be bilked out of anything. And so now as an adult, exactly. you have stepped up to the plate for people who are, are at risk, are at risk because uh, it let me just put a point blank. There are a lot of predators around, Joel. Nobody knows that better than you do yeah. because you see, you see them all the time. You help people and you see the predators, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, again, I probably didn't even know what was going on half the time, but you could see how it would, what the effect it would have, you know, on, on my mother. And, uh, you know, you, you saw both. You saw people who were incredibly kind, compassionate, who'd go out of their right. way. Uh, to help and other people who are trying to take advantage of you. And, uh, you know, between those two camps, you know, I knew from day one where, which camp I wanted to be in. And uh, yeah, that, that really, really, like I said, that's really what motivates me. That's right. And from, so from Western Pennsylvania and you grow up and you realize did at some point then, did you realize that, you know, uh, unlike, unlike me, you had a knack mm -hmm. for numbers, <laughs> I had two and two and get five, and I swear to God, I see nothing wrong with it. But obviously, that was not the case with you. <laughs> you know, did you notice as a youngster? Well, wow, I, I I have a knack for this stuff. I, you know, I, yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I delivered I delivered newspapers as a kid, and you know, I had to always in my head, you know, figure out how much somebody owed and what their change was, and you know, if they owed one week, two weeks, three weeks, did they get the Sunday paper or not? You know, there were a lot of math variables. And then early on, you know, I would take money that I earned from delivering newspapers. I would go to the store and buy candy. And then I would put that candy in my lunchbox and I'd take the lunchbox to school and I'd sell the candy uh, to my <laughs> my friends and classmates. And so, you know, I, I, I was always trying to figure out how to how to uh, magnify, you know, increase wealth. And, and I think, you know, again, uh, sometimes I think what we do today as adults is really not that different than, you know, what we were doing back then. It's, it's really about making money, saving it, investing it, trying to deploy it in ways that, um, you know, helps you make more. So, you know, eventually you come to the point where, you know, you don't, you, you, maybe, you maybe you don't want to work or you can't work physically, mentally. Um, so you want to build up your assets so that you can, um, you know, so you can live comfortably in your retirement and, you know, nothing is worse 
for me to see is then somebody taking advantage or, or taking uh, money of a, of a person who's an elderly person, because, you know, people my age, even, even your age, Carter, you know, there's, there's lots of time. <laughs> there's lots of time to go speaking, out and speaking of elderly people, <laughs> <laughs> there's lots of time to go out and make more. But, you know, when you see people who are scammed out of their retirement, you know, people that are in their eighties and you just, you know, your heart goes out to them because, you know, they, they have no ability to go back and recapture that. So um, that's, that's really, again, you know, one of the things that makes me get up in the morning and, and makes me want to, you know, work and help people accomplish their goals and objectives. And I tell people all the time, they ask me like, what do you think I should invest in? I say, you know, I'm not really the guy for that. I'm, I'm not the guy to tell you what to invest in. I, I probably have opinions, you know, opinions are like noses. Everybody has one, but I don't think right. my opinion is any better than yours or anybody else's. Uh, but when it comes to saving, protecting, preserving, passing on all those P words, you know, that's really what I focus on. And I tell clients, look, you know, if I can help you keep from losing your money, like the great Chinese general Sun Tzu and the art of war, you know, before he'd go into battle, he, he figured out he wanted to make sure that he couldn't lose the war. Right. Yes. Because yeah. if the wor if the worst thing that could happen was a stalemate, then, you know, then his only, you know, the only solution was that or, or better to win the war. And that's how I am with my clients. I want to make sure they can't lose the war. I want to make sure nobody's going to rip their money out away from them. Um, you know, they're all different types of clients that come through our, our office, you know, a, a, a frequent um, combination might be an, an older guy and a younger wife, for example, you know, maybe it's the second or third uh, marriage and the guy's up there. He knows that his wife's going to outlive him. He might have kids from an earlier um, marriage. He wants to be fair to them and make sure they get something. Wants to make sure he's providing for the wife and, uh, you know, and maybe she's not able to, um, invest and save the way he might want her to. So he might say, look, I want to create a, a trust structure so that, um, you know, it's, it's almost like an allowance where X amount of dollars comes out every month. That's just one example. And I'm not trying to be male chauvinistic, but I, I see that example quite a bit. I, I get the example with elderly parents. I get the example with special needs children who are maybe handicapped. Uh, parents want to provide for them, but they know the, that, that that child will never be able to really take care of themselves financially. So we look for all the ways uh, that we can help the parents to achieve that that goal and objective for their children, even their adult children. Joe, you know, you really hit home when you said about, you know, the you have some of the older clients who have younger, younger wives. You know, I, I think that. Uh, that is a that's a burden. My wife is um, somewhat younger than me, about five decades. And the other day, <laughs> there you was, go. somewhat, yeah. I was saying to her the other day, Princess, see this two thousand two Thunderbird sports car here. That is part of your. That's part of your trust for when you get old, because by the time you get to be my age, it'll be worth about three hundred thousand dollars. And it sounds funny, but it is true. You right. look to find a way to say to them, you know, that you have to have, a, 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 you have to preserve your assets. You have to protect your assets. And, and right. And you, you're there you for would have want, people. Yeah. yeah. And you would want some, you wouldn't want to find out, you know, 20 years from now, um, somebody came and said, oh, this old thing, I'll give you 500 bucks for it. Right. And you exactly. want to make sure that, that the value is there. I mean, yeah. one of the stories that I can remember, um, you know, I don't even know I should tell this story. It's a pretty personal story, but you know, my mother at one point when she literally had no money, um, my father, um, one of the things he really loved was coins and he had a coin collection. It wasn't a, 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 an immense coin collection, but you know, he, he um, collected pre 1964, um, you know, the, they call it now junk silver, right? It's the, the coins that still had silver in them. Right. And uh, my, my lunch cost, uh, 35 cents and uh and and she would give me a quarter and a dime from uh you know from his coin collection and i knew that that wasn't right i knew that there was more intrinsic value to that than than just spending it wow. you know for 35 cents for lunch money and i said no i 
you know, don't, don't, um, don't give me that anymore. I'll, I'll figure it out myself. That's when the paper route and the, and the, um, you know, the candy and all that started. And, and, you know, some people look at that and say, wow, that was, that was, that was pretty tough, but, um, you know, it taught me those skills early on. And I, I meet people today. They don't, they don't know, they, 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 you know, even if they earn money and this isn't, you know, any, and have anything to do with wealth or education or background. Some people are just a little bit more gifted in, in uh, magnifying and growing wealth than others. I mean, I have, I can think of a doctor client I have, he makes $800,000 a year. And I kid you not, he has no money saved, nothing. No investments, nothing. He wow. he makes eight hundred thousand dollars. He pays his taxes and he spends the rest. And there's a lot of people like that out there. You know, whatever. Some people even spend more than what they make. You know, that's that's why the credit card industry is doing so well because you know yeah. people literally are spending more than, than than they're earning. But if you can do the opposite, you know, um, you try to live at maybe 80 percent of your means, put the rest away, save it, invest it. Um, hopefully you make some good investments along the way. And I've seen the opposite. I mean, I've seen a school teacher who never made more than $50,000 a year in their life retire with, you know, $3 million in the bank because, you know, they read a lot. They, you know, caught the wave on things like Walmart and, you know, uh, companies like that because they, that's how they spent their, their free time was educating themselves, making what well, they, you know, it was never a big investment, but right. doing it. Right consistently and over time and, and then using time to your advantage i tell my kids like look you know they're in their 20s a number of my kids are in their 20s i'm like look you you set up a retirement account now and put a few bucks in it you know that'll be way that'll be way more than you know killing yourself when you're in your 40s and 50s to, to you know worried as you approach retirement you know are you put enough put a little bit aside now because the effect for it all. Well, that, that's precisely. And the, you know, the, the idea of a, the defense, the defense, the importance of the defense. You remember, you remember uh, uh, Adolf Rupp. I don't know if you remember him or not. He was one of the greatest basketball coaches of all time. Uh, Kentucky university of Kentucky won 876 games. And Rupp said, your defense will, let me read it to make sure I get it right. Your defense will save you the night uh, when your offense isn't working. Your defense will save you the nights your offense isn't working. And I know that's your philosophy. You've got to have that defense. Yeah. You've got to have that. Well, asset. you know, I'm, yeah, I mean, you know, you know me I'm from Pittsburgh and uh, you can't yes, grow I up know. in Pittsburgh. and You can't grow up in Pittsburgh and not be a Steeler fan. And, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> they're not doing so great these days, but you know, when I was a kid, that was, that was the seventies when they, you know, really made it, they went from worst. Yeah. They oh, went yeah. from worst to first. And if yep. you, if you look at that and you take, and you, and you read a little bit about it, it's interesting. Chuck Knoll was hired to become the coach of the Steelers, 1969. The Steelers were one in 13. They had the very first pick in the draft the next year. And, you know, in, in today's uh, era, you know, you're going to go out and you're going to, you're going to grab a quarterback or whatever. Um, Chuck Knoll used the first pick of the draft to draft a guy by the name of Mean Joe Green. I'm sure, you've, I'm sure you you know that name. Being um, from Baltimore, then, you know, I really hated him. I, being from Baltimore, <laughs> I really hated him all my life. Yeah, yeah. But subsequent picks were Ernie Holmes and Dwight White and you know Jack yep. Ham, Jack Lambert, and you know the, the great offensive people. He he eventually got around to going out and finding like Terry Bradshaw and Franco Harris and, you know, these more offensive names, but he didn't start there. He started with defense, just like Sun Tzu from 3000 years ago in the art of war. And it was the exact same thing. I mean, he basically said, you know, look at, look at 1974. That was the first year the Steelers went to the Super Bowl, Super Bowl nine. Yeah. The halftime, the halftime scores against Minnesota. The halftime score was the lowest halftime score in Super Bowl history. It, it, it was almost surpassed this last Super Bowl, uh, but this, the halftime score of Super Bowl nine was two to nothing. Well, how do you get how do you get two points in football? Safety, safety right? Who, who, who scores who, who scores the safety? The defense. So yeah. you know yeah. he he basically said 
You know, I want to intimidate the other team. I want them to know they can't run, they can't pass, they're not going to score. And, you know, with them being completely demoralized like that, then maybe my mediocre offense can score some points and win the game. Um, And then later, of course, he brought in weapons that made a high-powered offense and high-powered defense at the same time. Now, that's great. I mean, yeah. that's that's having somebody like me help you with the defense, and having you know, um, you know, you Warren Buffett help you with your offense, right? I mean, exactly. you get that combination, and you're yeah. you know, re- you're probably going to be okay. And um, but but it's just really interesting to look at that because he always started with the defense, and and by the way, he was the first coach that when he won the coin toss, he deferred. Now now they all do that, but if when they asked him why he did that. It was basically because he had an awesome defense and he had a crappy offense, and he wanted right. to start the game by right. putting, you know. And he felt like he that if if the defense really, you know, did its thing, it would demoralize and intimidate the other team. And when we create asset protection structures, that's what exactly what we're doing. We're trying to demoralize and intimidate the other team. Hey, you're going to come after us. We're not the low hanging fruit. You're gonna you're gonna have to go in jurisdictions you never heard of. You're gonna have to fight the fight on multiple. Uh, fronts and you know the laws are stacked against you there you know because money flows to where it's treated best and unfortunately right now that is not the u.s so there's you know i think at last count we work in uh, about 43 countries around the world creating asset protection structures and quite frankly for you know for different pieces and parts but um, they all have some advantage over the United States. If if the U.S. was the best jurisdiction, we'd do everything in the United States. It wouldn't bother, right? Us, right? right. But, but it's not. So we're, we're, we're trying to find the best pro-defense jurisdictions. We're not looking for a pro-plaintiff system like the U.S. We're looking for a pro-defense system. Excellent. Excellent. I think that is absolutely vital because in terms of asset protection, a lot of people don't know that if you... If you're not careful, they'll come at you from every direction. And that I'll be honest with you. I'm not a wealthy person. I own uh, four homes, two in this country, two offshore. The two offshore I'm not as worried about, quite frankly, to be honest with you, as I am the homes in this country because of the litigation in this country. And you, right. with your ability to protect against assets, I know you advise people to somehow protect your, like it, my homes here against somebody contriving something. You know, somebody said, a lawyer once said to me, you know what it takes to file a lawsuit? And I said, no, he said a typewriter. And that's pretty much it. Mm -hmm. And so you help your clients understand you've got to protect that home is an asset that can be lost like that in a lawsuit. Right. Am I right? Yeah. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And I just yesterday was with a client here in Belize and, uh, you know, they have a very beautiful, very lovely home in the states and they happen to live in a, in a state unlike Florida and Texas and some of the states that do protect your your homes. There are many states like mine, Pennsylvania, that really don't. Um, so, you know, the client said, well, I can't, I can't pick my house up and move it. You know, what should I do? And uh, we came up with a strategy to help them significantly borrow, basically strip out the equity of the, of the home and move the cash offshore. And um, people would say, well, you know, I don't like debt. I don't, I don't want debt. But the thing is, the debt we pulled out, we could match offshore with like, let's say a CD in a bank somewhere where the interest from that CD offset the interest cost back in the States. So, you know, if that person tried to go after their home, first of all, the lawyer is going to look at it and say, oh, you've got this million dollar home, but there's $950,000 in debt on it. You know, that's not very interesting for us. And by the way, even if we win and get a judgment against it and the judge orders the home to be sold, you know, you're never going to get in front of the bank, right? So if Bank America or Citibank or somebody holds that mortgage, uh, you're stuck behind the mortgage holder. So, you know, it, it's sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy because by having that those that debt in place and that and that and that real mortgage of a of a major commercial bank on your property, you're actually making your property safer and it's less likely that anybody's gonna ever be able to attack and and take that home away. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, anytime you want, you can reverse the, you know, the strategy, pull the money out out of the offshore CD, pay off the the property. But if somebody does get the property, well, you already have your money offshore in your case, okay, you'd you'd lose a home, but you'd have all that money 
sitting in one of the offshore jurisdictions where you have your other homes and yeah. you know you, you, you it, it would change the dynamic of your assets but you actually wouldn't have lost anything which is fantastic that's great advice folks that is excellent advice and <clears throat> that's one reason why we're, they should go to nagellaw.com <laughs> right nagellaw.com folks and if you have any questions about asset protection look at the advice you're getting here and there's a lot more of it. So, Joel, so you're a young, you're a kid, worked hard as a kid. How did, did you get a scholarship to college or how did you? You know, I, I did. I did. I, I went to Allegheny College in Western Pennsylvania. Um, it's a fantastic private liberal arts school. Um, you know, I think they, they prided themselves in helping first generation people go to college. I think they, they really still do. Um, I met my uh, wife there. I met my longtime business partner, Mike Cobb there. Um, and um, we'll get to that. Yeah. yeah. You know, it was a fantastic environment. I mean, you know, it was a somewhat liberal place even then, but um, it encouraged free discussion, free debate. You know, I, I was on a debate team and, you know, the debates we have today are they're not debates. I mean, you can't give one liners and call somebody a name and, and, and think you're going to win anything. I mean, right. we had, uh, we had uh, debates where, you know, you had to do a lot of research. My, my youngest daughter uh, goes to school in Austria and uh, she was on a debate team and, and we, I, she was trying to prepare. And I said, well, the first thing you have to do is you need to prepare the arguments of the other side. She's like, well, why would I do that, Dad? I said, because how can you argue against them if you don't even know what they are? And I think that's the that's the problem we have in America today, you know, particularly with our political system. People don't know, they don't even know their side, let alone the other mm -hmm. side. And yep. it's so easy to just call somebody a name. You know, if you disparage somebody and call them a racist, a sexist, a, a this, a that, you know, it, it kind of ends the debate. Um, and if I, if I go forward into uh, law school, for example, again, we're arguing and debating. Uh, you know, I had a, um, a, I had a trial advocacy course with a fantastic professor. Same thing. I mean, you, 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 you had to know your facts. You had to know the other side's facts. And what he would famously do in the middle of a debate, literally in the middle of a debate, an organized debate, is he would make the party switch sides. <laughs> so how about that? You're you're making one argument, and he comes along and says, "Hey, Joel, like you're doing a great job, but I want you to argue the other side." Yep. And um, so you know the old the old saying was, you know, if you had the facts on your side, you'd pound on the facts, and if you had the law on your side, you'd pound on the law, and if you didn't have the facts or the law on your side, you pounded on the table. And that's <laughs> that's that, I think I think that's mostly what we have today. We just have people pounding on the table. Pounding so. On the table. Um, but anyways, I, I enjoy I enjoy real debate, um, you know, where, again, people are exchanging ideas, but it's becoming it's becoming honestly few and far between. I don't really know of any doesn't matter if it's right wing, left wing or it says it's neutral. You, you just really don't have any of that true debate out there that you used to have. But, uh, you know, in the in the legal environment, it's still really important because, you know, as an advocate for your clients, you're always trying to convince somebody of something You're whether you're in trial, whether you're, you know, arguing with the IRS, whether you're, you know, you're always arguing with somebody. And, uh, you know, one of my mentors early on said you, you need to convey the sense of of superiority either intellectual superiority Excellent. or preparation or preparation superiority. I mean, I've gone into meetings and the other side, again, they, they certainly don't understand my position. They don't understand their position. Right. And, you know, right. and they're, you know, from the IRS or SEC or whatever, some government agency that's coming in to look at something, um, you know, you just make it clear that, you know, if you're going to come after me, you're going to come after my clients. It's going to be an uphill battle because I understand where I'm coming from. And I understand where you're coming from. And um, it's not going to be, there's definitely low hanging fruit somewhere else. I tell clients that all the time. Look, you know, because people say, are, are, are there guarantees in what you do? I said, no, there's, there's really no guarantees. But, you know, there are, um, you, you know, you're, you're the apple at the top of the tree way out on the edge of the limb. It's going to be very, very hard to get to you. It's fantastic. It's fantastic. And, we have to draw to a close here, but I'm glad you mentioned at college is where you met Mike Cobb because your your show, your podcast, the Wealth Fortress Report, 
tells people how to protect their assets. Mike has a weekly podcast, the Offshore Investment Report, where he is the other side of it. Once, Joel, you have helped people protect their assets, Mike helps them know some of the ways offshore they can multiply those assets. So it's a, it's yeah, a well, perfect per- tandem. It's yeah, well, partic- particularly in the real estate um, environment, nobody knows more than Mike. He's yep. very much sought after. You know, he's on the National Association of Realtors, spoken on foreign real estate all over the world. And you're right. I mean, we we uh, I'll give you one little one little personal secret. You can bring it up with him since you're asking me a lot of personal right. questions. Yep. Way back in our college days, we had a radio show together on W A R C radio in Meadville, Pennsylvania. So well, that was the Mike, the Mike and the Mike and Joel show 35 years ago. And uh, we weren't talking about stuff like this. We we're mostly just playing, uh, you know, rock music that would turn most people, you know, over in their graves. But uh, we had a great time doing that. Don't don't tell him you told me because I'm going to spring it. On. That's great. That's yeah. great. Well, that, Joel, this has been fantastic. And I know, I know that, you know, I, I, that those who are watching now know that that Joel Nagel is not only someone you can trust professionally, but personally as well. And I really, you know, I've known that obviously impressed with you on both both aspects from the day we met. And now, folks, those of you who have watched this this podcast, you see for yourself, this is a gentleman of integrity. And now you know why. That's fantastic. So, Joel, thank Thank you, you. Carter. I appreciate that. And, you know, next week for our show, I'll be in the financial capital of the world, New York City. Again, yeah. helping people, you know, race the clock uh, before the holidays to to get things done. And um, but uh, look forward to taking a little time out from from there to speak with you again. And certainly wish you and Thank you know you. our producers and everybody involved with this uh, program and everybody who's watching it a very merry Christmas. Thank you very much, Joel. Merry Christmas to you and folks. Merry Christmas to you, and we will see you next week. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for joining Joel Nagel and the Global Wealth Fortress Report, a whole new approach to asset protection and estate planning so that now you can live the good life at a great price, where the sun never sets on your financial fortress.